Good afternoon, folks. We welcome you once again to our discipleship program sponsored by the River of Life Assembly here in Miramichi. And uh, we look forward to sharing with you in the next few minutes uh, from the Word of God. We're excited about what God is doing, and I trust that uh, you are open to receive from God today. He has something good in store for you, and uh, there is a joy in the journey as we live and walk with God uh, there's plenty of uh, joy that we have in just walking with him day by day. And uh, I'm excited about that. And uh, we're going to bow our heads together in prayer and not just simply ask God to speak to our hearts as we open up the pages of his word today. Father, we thank you today. We thank you because you're on the throne. We thank you because you care for us. You love us with an everlasting love. Your love is from everlasting to everlasting. Your grace is without measure. Your mercies are new every morning. Lord, you are good. You are a good, good God. And we worship you and glorify you as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And Lord, today as we open up this Bible study and we open up the pages of your word, we ask that you'd help us to also open up the doors to our hearts and allow your spirit to speak to us and to move in our lives. We need you today, Lord. We ask you to feed us. We're hungry for the word of God. And we'll be careful to praise you for it, Lord, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to be looking uh, today for a, a few moments into the kingdom of God. The Greek term kingdom is used over 162 times in the New Testament. And it is dynamic in nature and refers to the rule or reign of a king. It seldom is used in reference to territory. And that's something that we, we uh, seem to struggle with. Even the uh, early New Testament church, the disciples, they followed the master and they thought, Lord, are you going to set up your kingdom at this time? And they didn't seem to have the, a grasp or concept of what God was actually doing and what Jesus Christ was going to accomplish here on earth. So we want to take a look at that. There's many things, uh, many think that the kingdom of God refers to heaven. There are those that think that it simply refers to the church. But if we were going to use a biblical definition or understanding, it would be God's universal reign as creator and redeemer. His reign and rule as our creator and redeemer. You see, God is eternal. Therefore, because of that very fact, his kingdom is eternal and it transcends time and space. So trying to look at a geographical location and say this is where he is and this is where he reigns and, and, and the things that he is, is doing are going to be accomplished there, that's not the right concept, friend. We have to lift up our eyes and our understanding a little bit into realizing how great the kingdom of God is. So today, if you're uh, taking notes, if you want to take a pen and some paper, uh, we're going to look at 10 things concerning the kingdom of God. The first is that God reigns above all things. God reigns above all things. The book of Psalms, the 24th chapter, verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world and they that dwell therein. It all belongs to him. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. The same book of the Bible, the book of Psalms, the 103rd chapter, says this in verse 19. The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. So his throne is in the heavens and he rules over all. That three-letter word is very inclusive. It didn't say some. It didn't say part of. 
It said his throne is in the heavens and he rules over all. The book in the New Testament, the book of Colossians, and, and we're going to have several uh, passages of scripture that we're going to be looking at today. So if you have your Bibles, we'll give you the references and allow you to, uh, to go to them. And, and here we go. Colossians. Colossians, the first chapter, verse 16 and verse 17 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether there be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So he is the creator. He is the creator. And he reigns over all. He reigns over all things. So that's number one when we're going to look at the kingdom of God. Number two is the fact that sin challenged God's authority over his kingdom. We're going to go into the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, the 12th chapter. And here the Bible is giving us a little bit of an understanding of what took place way back even before creation. The Bible says in Revelation, the 12th chapter and 4th verse, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered and to devour her child as soon as it was born. As it was born. So here it's uh, prophetically talking about uh, way back in the Old Testament, way back before the Old Testament, how that Satan had elevated himself and his, he caused over a third of the stars or the angels of heaven to be cast down. So the enemy challenged God's authority in the heavens. Then we turn around in the book of Gen Gen uh, Genesis, the second chapter, we are told and shown how that Satan convinced man to trust in himself rather than God. Man trusted in his own half-truth and desires, and instead of trusting in what God had said, they trusted in what the enemy had said and what they conceived in their own minds as a half truth, and they followed their own desires. The Bible says when they looked upon the tree, they saw and that it was good to eat. Their eyes deceived them, and they desired it. So, you see, sin challenged God's authority over his kingdom. And as a result, man was cast out of the garden. Now, the third thing you need to understand concerning the kingdom of God, is that God promised a kingdom. Genesis, the 12th chapter, verse 2 and 3. Listen to what it says. And I will make of thee, referring to Abraham, a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And then it says, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So God promised that he was going to establish a nation, a kingdom, through Abraham. Genesis, the 26th chapter, puts it this way, verse 4. Genesis chapter 26 and verse 4. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven and will give unto thy seed all these countries and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. So God promised that he was going to establish a kingdom. The fourth thing, and I, I'm trying to move it along here just so because we've got so many scriptures that we want to look at today that I want you to be able to understand these principles. God shows his standard of holiness within his kingdom. He gives laws to Moses to set the people apart. Exodus, the 19th chapter, verses 3 through 6. 
Exodus 19, verses 3 through 6, And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. Now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. He again establishes the fact that he is supreme. He reigns over all. It's all his. I will make you a peculiar treasure of unto me above all other people. And it makes a statement there that uh, it says, how I bore you on eagle's wings. Isn't that a beautiful concept? How that in the wilderness, in the desert places, when they were wandering around, that he bore them on eagle's wings. He lifted them up above all the drudgery and all the things that were there, and they could soar with him. Beautiful concept. So God shows his standard of holiness within his kingdom. He gives them the law, the truth of God's word, to show them how they should act and how they should live. And he places them into, and, and says, if you'll do those things, then I'm going to establish a kingdom with you. God foreshadowed his kingdom, number five, he foreshadowed his kingdom on earth. The book of Acts. Going to the book of Acts, the 13th chapter. And here we go, book of Acts. Acts, the 13th chapter. Verses 22 and 23. Here is Paul preaching. And the Bible says, And afterward they desired a king, and he's talking to them, how that the children of Israel desired a king, and God gave them unto, uh, unto them Saul, the son of uh, Seus, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, for the space of 40 years. And when he had removed him, the Bible says, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Of this man's seed hath God, according to this promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. So Jesus established a nation, and he said that he was going to raise up through that nation and through a king called David, that through his lineage there would be a Savior that would be provided. And he, uh, Paul says that that Savior was Jesus. So God establishes his kingdom. He foreshadowed his kingdom on earth. And he told the, the children of Israel when he uh, called and chose David as their king that he was going to establish a line through David that the Messiah, the Savior, would come. Number six was the is the fact that the kingdom established here on earth when Jesus Christ came into the world. The Bible says in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew, the third chapter. And verse 2. And let's start at verse 1. In, these, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he was preaching and proclaiming the fact that the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Then we look and we find in the Gospel of John, the very first cha uh, chapter in the Gospel of John. Here we go. John 1 and verse 29, it says this. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. So John was preaching saying, Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he saw Jesus Christ 
the fullness and the revelation of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven on earth. And he said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the, spin, the sin of the world. You see, the children, the children of Israel, the nation of Israel during the time of the disciples, they were looking and longing for a Messiah, for the promised one, the Savior. But their idea was that he was going to come and he was going to establish his kingdom here and now in a physical way. He was going to throw out the armies of Rome. He was going to establish his kingdom. He was going to sit on the throne in Jerusalem and he was going to reign. And everything was going to be wonderful for them. That was their concept of what was going to take place right then and there. And they didn't realize that the kingdom of God was actually a spiritual thing that was about to take place in their lives. John the 18th chapter. John chapter 18 verse 36. Listen to what it says. Jesus answered. Now here he is standing before Pilate. And Pilate is asking him questions. And then the Bible says, I'm going to start at verse 31. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, saying, Sayest thou this of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and thy chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? So he's saying, they're saying, you're a revolutionary. They're saying you've come here to usurp the authority of Rome and they've asked me to cast judgment upon you. Are you the king of the Jews? Are you trying to set up a kingdom here over in Israel and rule over the Jews? Is that who you are? Is that what you're trying to do? Jesus answered and he said in verse 36, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. My kingdom is not of this world. It's something that, it's not a tangible thing that you can say, here is the territory that my, my uh, kingdom is established in and this is where I rule and reign. And this is what I have control over because God is sovereign. He is Lord over all. He rules and reigns over all. So his kingdom is established in the hearts of men. It is a spiritual thing. Number seven, the kingdom of God is to be received. It's to be received. It's not to be found, but it's to be received. The Bible says in the Gospel of Mark, Mark the 10th chapter. Mark the 10th chapter, verses 13 through 16. Listen to what it says. And they brought young children to him that he should touch them, and his disciples rebuked those that brought them. And when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, put his hands upon them, and he blessed them. He said, whosoever shall not receive so you receive the kingdom of God. Entrance into the kingdom of God requires belief and repentance. Mark the first chapter, verse, chapter 1, verse 15. 
says this. Jesus speaking and, and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. The time is at hand. Time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. So repent and believe the gospel. The gospel of Matthew, the third chapter, verse 2, says it this way. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The gospel of Matthew, the fourth chapter, in verse 23, says it this way. And Jesus went about all Galilee teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among all the people. So again, he's, t he's teaching them, showing them the kingdom of God is here. Well, what changed? Rome is still here. Rome still rules over the land. Their soldiers are still here. How can that be two different kingdoms? Because one is a spiritual kingdom that you receive in your heart by repenting and believing. The kingdom of God resides, the Bible says, within us. The Gospel of Luke. Luke 17, verse 21. I'm going to start reading at verse 20. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. It's not something you can see with this natural eye because it's not a territorial thing. Neither shall they say, Lo, here or lo, there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. It is within you. It is something you receive and you believe. You repent and receive Jesus Christ into your life and you receive the kingdom of God. You see, the church is part of that kingdom but it's not the totality of the kingdom. There is a, he, his kingdom is rules and reigns over everything. The kingdom of God is mysterious. Matthew, the 13th chapter, verses 11 through 23. Throughout the whole chapter of Matthew, the 13th chapter, he, uh, he teaches parables and he talks about the parable of the sower, parable of the mustard seed, and he begins to show them about the kingdom of heaven. And he says in chapter 13, verses 11 through 23, listen to what he says. I'll just read it real quickly. And he answered and said unto them, because it is written unto you to know uh, it is given unto you to know the mysteries, so he said mysteries, of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. In other words, these people that are not believers, that are following us, I'm teaching parables, and they don't understand because it's not given to them to understand, but it is given unto you. For whosoever saith to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance, but whosoever hath not, from him shall he take away, even that which he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parable, because they see, seeing not, and hearing, they hear not. Neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecies of Isaiah, which says, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their eyes are dull, ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and she should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for you they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see these things which you see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which you hear, and have not heard them. 
Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When one heareth the word of the kingdom, here he is talking about the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and casteth away that which was sown in their heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon with joy receiveth it. Yet hath he not root in himself, but doeth for, uh, but doth for a while, but then tribulation or persecution arise because of the word, and by and by he that is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that bears, hears the word, and the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becomes unfruitful. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth some an hundred, some sixty, and some thirty. And then he goes on and he begins to teach them another parable. And he teaches several parables here, all concerning the kingdom of God. He says about the sower, it was concerning the kingdom. So the kingdom of God is a mysterious thing. It's a spiritual thing. The book of Romans, the 14th chapter. Romans, the 14th chapter and verse 17. For the kingdom, Paul writing to the church, for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink. It is not natural, tangible things that we see and hear and touch and taste. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but it is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. It is a spiritual thing that takes place in our heart. We believe and receive. We repent and ask Jesus Christ into our hearts and lives, and he comes into our hearts. He resides there. Jesus said concerning the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, he said when he, concerning his leaving, he said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come and dwell in you. He gave them the promise of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ, through his Holy Spirit, will live and abide in our hearts and lives. And that kingdom of God is perceived through the Spirit. It's not meat nor drink, but it is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God has applications, number 10, for believers today. You see, it's not just simply what Jesus did and what he instructed us to do, but his will wants to be accomplished in our lives. Why? Because kingdom has to do with ruling and reigning. Going back from the very beginning when I first mentioned an actual definition of a kingdom, it's an area in which a king rules and reigns. His will is sovereign. He has control. He is the great creator, the maker of all things. The word of God said, by him was nothing made that was made. So he is, the heavens are his throne, the earth is his footstool, and he rules and reigns over all. So his will being done in our lives and in the things that we are evolved with is a very important implication for our lives. Matthew, the sixth chapter, and verse 10. His disciples had came to him in the Sermon on the Mount, and he asked them, they asked him to teach them how they should pray. And the Bible says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter in thy closet, and when thou hast shut the door, Pray to your Father which is in secret, and your Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetition as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth that which he hath need of before you ask. After this manner, therefore pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. There is a future coming of the kingdom of God at the end of this age that is yet to happen when he will actually establish a physical kingdom upon this earth. He will rule and reign, and we will rule and reign with him for a thousand years. But until then, the children of God are to act as ambassadors of God. That's according to the word of God. We are his ambassadors. And he told us through the Great Commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel. To tell people about the goodness and the love of God, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary for their sins, and now how they can know him as Lord of Lords. And he can rule in their hearts and they can know and have the knowledge of sins forgiven, being washed through his blood. So, in that process, in doing that, he tells us to pray for his kingdom to come in our hearts and lives and in the things we deal with. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done. Why? Because you are Lord. You are king. You rule and reign over all. And in my life, Lord, we surrender to you we ask you to let your will be done. So that's some of the things we just wanted to look quickly in a basic understanding of the kingdom of God. And there's so much more in what the kingdom of God actually involves in our lives daily through this, a spiritual walk with God and we see his kingdom established in our life. You see, friend, that kingdom of God that is not meat nor drink but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost lets us know that all those things are experienced through the Spirit of God. You know, there's nothing that we can do in our own selves to become holy, to become righteous, because He has imputed unto us His righteousness. He has made us holy because He has washed us in His blood and made us holy. And as we surrender to him and we allow him to lead and direct our lives, we can see the kingdom of God strengthened and established in our lives and around us. And it's a wonderful experience. So if you haven't, if you haven't received Jesus Christ, you're not far from the kingdom of God, the Bible says, but the kingdom of God is here and you can receive it and you can perceive it, and you can understand it by receiving Jesus Christ into your hearts, by repenting of your sins, asking him to cleanse you, and begin to look into his word and allow his word to lead you. We're going to bow our heads today. Father, we thank you. We thank you for the word of God and for those that have listened today on our broadcast and Lord, whatever avenue it might be, wherever they are today, if they're at home, if they're in the car somewhere, wherever they are, I pray that your spirit would speak to them and let them know that they can know the riches of the kingdom of God. They can know the joy of the kingdom of God. They can know the peace that comes with dwelling in the presence of God, the kingdom of God, by allowing your spirit to rule and reign in their lives. Your word said, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And just as you rule and reign sovereignly in heaven and your perfect will is done, Lord, we ask you to rule and reign in our lives and for your perfect will to be accomplished in it. I pray for each one that's listened today and that they would open their hearts and draw close to you and surrender to you. And we'll be careful to give you praise and glory for everything that's done. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you today, and we appreciate you being with us, and we have hope that you just have a great and wonderful day. Lord bless you.